and glad that you could be here for our morning worship and our uh, study of the scriptures as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 25 this morning and think about the cross of Jesus. Before I begin, I just wanted to say a thank you to all of you who had a part in our Vacation Bible School this past week. It was another uh, great one, and uh, one of the reasons it is is because we have so many willing workers. Uh, I think every year we have about an equal number of workers to uh, children, and that's uh, remarkable, I think. And uh, you're to be commended, and we certainly appreciate your efforts and uh, know that God is glorified in your willingness to come and help the children in whatever way, whether you're teaching or doing crafts or uh, providing the uh, the snacks, I think especially the snacks. Um, but all the, all the things that were done through the week uh, did not go unnoticed and are certainly very much appreciated. As you heard read at the outset of our service this morning, just, just a few days before Jesus went to the cross, John chapter 12, verse 32, says that he made this statement, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. What precipitated that is back in verse 20 when some Greeks or Gentiles came seeking Jesus and said, we, we want to see Jesus. And so you have people from outside Israel who are beginning to come wanting to see Jesus, wanting to come to Jesus. And it's interesting as you read John 12 because we're never told that Jesus met with these people. We're never told that he spoke with them. We're never told that he had any, any interaction with them at all. But instead, their coming caused him to say that his hour had finally come, the hour of his glorification, the hour of his death. And he said that by uh, being lifted up on the cross, he would draw all people to himself. And I think by all people, what he meant was both Jews and Gentiles. Nobody's going to be excluded all kinds of people are going to be drawn to the cross, to himself. The message of God's saving love manifested in Jesus' sacrifice was going to have a universal appeal that would cut across all lines of nationality, race, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic barriers, everything. All kinds of people were going to be drawn to the cross. And one reason I think this means all kinds of people, and by the way, there are people who interpret that other ways, but one reason I think it means all kinds of people is that it is clear that not everyone is drawn to the cross. Not everyone is drawn to Jesus. The last verse in our reading this morning, verse 37, said, Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. They still didn't believe in him. And even after he was lifted up on the cross, they still didn't believe in him. Most did not believe. Most were not drawn to Jesus by the cross. And the book of Acts testifies that when thousands of people responded to the preaching of the cross on the day of Pentecost, and we're always impressed with that, there were many more thousands who heard that day who were not, uh, did not respond to the cross. There were many more who rejected Jesus because they did not believe. And it's been that way ever since, hasn't it? Down through the ages, I have no idea how many millions of people have been drawn to the cross. I have no idea how many people have come to Christ because they've heard the story that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and that Jesus was lifted up on the cross for their sins. I don't know how many people that is, but I know this, that there are many millions more who have rejected that same message. There are many millions more who have heard and others who have not heard who have rejected the story of salvation through Jesus' death. And the question I want us to think about this morning is, why? Why isn't everybody drawn to the cross? Why are so many drawn and yet so many others turn away from the message that God longs to save them so much that he gave his own son to die for their sins? If the cross has such a powerful appeal to so many, why doesn't it have that same appeal to all? Well, I think Paul gives us the answer to that in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 25. Now, this is a paragraph that comes in response to a problem of disunity in the church in Corinth. If you read verses 1 to 17 of chapter 1, you'll see that. 
There are people who are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of uh, Cephas, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ. And there, there are factions in the church in Corinth. And in response to that, Paul begins to talk about the cross. I think that's instructive for us. Anytime there were, was disunity or other kinds of problems in the church, Paul called people's attention to the cross. And that's what he does here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. The problem, you see, was they were taking pride in their own wisdom. They were each thinking that they were wiser than the others and taking pride in that human wisdom. And so Paul calls them away from that human wisdom to the wisdom of God. And he says that wisdom of God is demonstrated in the cross. And so from chapter 1 and verse 17 to chapter 2 and verse 5, 13 times Paul uses the word wisdom, and uh, six times he uses the word folly or foolishness. So he's contrasting human wisdom, supposed wisdom, to what humans regard as the foolishness of God and showing how the foolishness of God is far superior to the wisdom of men. And as he does that, he gives us some insight into why so many people reject the cross. And here's what he says in this paragraph. He says, first of all, they reject the cross because of human arrogance. You know, to most people, God's way of revealing himself through the cross sounds ridiculous. Paul knew that. We need to understand that. It just sounds ridiculous. He says the world did not know God through wisdom. And so God, through its own wisdom, that is, and so God chose a way that nobody would have ever imagined. No human being would have ever come up with this way of God revealing himself. Grasp him with our finite minds so clearly and so completely. And if, if he doesn't quite fit our box, we just reshape him until he does fit in our box. We're just arrogant enough to think that we can do that. Some are arrogant enough to think that they can do away with God to figure out that there is no God at, at all. And the problem is, you see, we're making ourselves the standard of what's true and what's false and what's right and what's wrong. We are judging God by our own thoughts. We are judging God by our own human standards. And Paul talks about that in this passage in 1 Corinthians 1. Notice in verse 22, he says, The Jews demand signs. He's talking about the Jews in the day of Jesus and in his own day. And there have been many people like this since. Jews are not. People who demand signs. People who think that God has to prove himself to them. God has to step up to the plate and do something that is so undeniably amazing that they will be compelled to believe in him. And if he doesn't do that, then they reject him. Well, the problem with that is there's never quite enough proof. There's never quite enough proof for folks like that. It doesn't matter what you do or what God does or what God has done. It's never quite enough. You remember the story of the Exodus? How God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh to let the people go and Pharaoh wouldn't do it. And so what did God do? He began sending those plagues on the people of Egypt. Ten plagues. Just one right after another. And they started on cue and they stopped on cue. They may have been natural in their effect, but they were, they were supernatural in their timing. And God sent those plagues on the people of Israel. And finally, Pharaoh not only was willing to let the people go, he drove them out of Egypt. He said, you guys get out of here. Please go away after the death of all the firstborn, including Pharaoh's own. And the people got out into the wilderness and God fed them miraculously and gave them water miraculously and they still turned away they still turned away from him they even went so far as to set up golden bulls for themselves and they said behold your gods O israel who brought you out of the land of egypt and we read that and think how could they be so foolish to think that those statues brought them out of Egypt and reject the God who had done such wondrous things. When people are demanding proof, it's never enough. When Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 men, not counting women and children, with five loaves and two fish, 
The Pharisees came to him immediately afterward and said, show us a sign. I always wonder what they wanted. What did they want him to do? Put an extra nose on everybody in the crowd? Or, you know, what did they think he was going to do that would, that would show us a sign of all things? Here he has just done this amazing thing. And they come to him and say, show us a sign. What is the problem? That, the, that what he had done wasn't sufficient? No, it's that no matter what he did, it would never be enough. It would never be sufficient. People whose faith depends on proof will never get enough to satisfy them. In John chapter 20, when Thomas at first was reluctant to believe in Jesus, and Jesus showed him his hands and his side and said, put your hand in there and touch me. That's what it takes. Stick your fingers into the wounds if you want. And Thomas melted and he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So there are those people who demand signs. On the other hand, Paul says in verse 22, Greeks or Gentiles seek wisdom. The Gentile people of his day and so many people today demand something that makes sense to them. They want something that appeals to what they regard as sophisticated and reasonable they want something that appeals to their mood and their mentality and the way they see the world. And if it doesn't, then they're going to reject it. Even though what they opt for may not make any sense at all. Eckhart Tolle, who is famous for his influence on Oprah Winfrey as her spiritual guide, has written this in one of his books. He says, you are the truth. If you look for it elsewhere, you will be deceived every time. Feeling will get you closer to the truth of who you are than thinking. Feeling will get you closer to the truth of who you are than thinking. It's no wonder his books are on the New York Times bestseller list. People like that. They want to hear that. Whatever you feel is the truth. Whatever you think is the truth. You are the truth, he says. People want something like that. But look at what Paul says by contrast in verses 23 and 24. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles. Why is it a stumbling block to Jews? Because how could a crucified Messiah save anybody? They were looking for a warrior king. They were looking for somebody to drive out Rome. They were looking for somebody to make them powerful and prominent and something again on the world stage. And here comes this man who says, I'm the Messiah, and he dies on a Roman cross. How's that going to do any good? We preach Christ crucified, Paul said, and a folly to the Gentiles. It was just illogical. How could the death of one man 2,000 years ago have any effect on me? How can that be? I've heard people ask that. How can the death of somebody so long ago possibly have any effect on me and on my eternal destiny? I just don't get it. Because this isn't logical. And here's what Paul is saying. That God has done something that is beyond human logic. God has done something that is greater than human reason. God has done something that is more powerful and wiser. And that something is the cross. And so he says in verse 26 that the preaching of the cross is God's foolishness. It is God's weakness, and it is far above our concepts of power and wisdom, so far above that there's really no comparison. God has chosen a way to reveal himself to humanity that in no way appeals to human pride. He's chosen a way that no human being would have ever thought of. He has chosen the cross of Jesus Christ. So people reject the cross because it does not appeal to their arrogance. People also reject the cross, Paul says, because it stands as a dividing line between those who are saved and those who are lost. Notice what he says in verse 18, the contrast between those who are perishing and those who are being saved. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
the two groups have a completely different outlook on the cross. People who are perishing, people who are on their way to spiritual destruction, think it's nonsense. People who cherish the cross see in it the wisdom and the power of God. Last week we talked about Romans 3, 21 to 26. How Jesus is the only possible solution to the problem of our sin. Why? Because the depth of our sin requires the perfect sacrifice that only he could offer. The problem, our sinfulness, the solution, the blood of Jesus. That means that when people repudiate the cross, they cannot be right with God. They can't. That's why Paul can speak of the perishing and those who are being saved. There are not multiple ways to God because we are all sinful and we all need the same thing. And so it isn't a matter of just selecting a religion. It's a matter of accepting the cross. What did Jesus himself say in John 14 and verse 6? He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. Why? Because nobody else can offer what he offers. Nobody else can do what he has done. No one else's blood can cleanse us from sin. And without the shedding of that blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And the world hates that. The world hates that. The world says that's arrogant. The world says that's bigoted. Actually, the opposite is true. Arrogance is thinking that we are the standard of reality. Arrogance is thinking that we are not sinful. Arrogance is thinking that we don't need the death of Jesus on the cross, that we can figure out some way for ourselves and we'll all be all right. That's arrogance. The world hates the message of the cross. To think that you aren't so sinful that you need a savior. To think that just any form of religion will do. No one who recognizes the truth of Romans 3.23 believes that. Paul wrote that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's why we have to have the message of the cross. And no one who believes Romans 3.23 resents the cross. But those who do resent the cross do so because they're not convinced of their own sin. Another reason Paul points out that people reject the cross is because it exposes human pretense and foolishness. You know, in Romans chapter 1, Paul talked about the fact that people reject the creator. What has been, what can be known about God is plain to them, Paul says in Romans 1, because it has been revealed to them in the creation. Everybody can see that. Everybody can see that we live in a created world and that that created world had to be created by somebody, but people deny that, don't they? They deny even that simple, basic, obvious truth. We've been told that science and technology have made God irrelevant and have made him unnecessary and that our technology explains everything for us that it's all just a matter of biology and physics, and so there's no need for a creator, there's no need for a savior, there's no need for a cross. Now, if that's true, given the advanced state of our science and technology, why are we still such a mess? Why are we still such a mess? You know, we just don't seem to get any better, do we? And when I say we, I'm not talking mostly about you, not me, but no, all of it. You know, why are we all such a mess? Why is the world such a mess? Why do we live in a world that cannot eliminate poverty and greed and bigotry and racism and hatred and violence? Why, Why are we like that? Why doesn't our technology solve that for us? If that's the answer to everything. Why, who do we think we're fooling by all of these false claims? You see, there's more to us than our genes. There's a spiritual dimension to each of us that science can't affect. It can't even realistically comment on it. 
can't realistically comment on it. There has to be a God dimension to our existence. And as long as we pretend that there isn't, we're groping in the darkness, claiming to be wise, Paul said, they became fools. Those who see themselves as the measure of everything despise the cross, and they always will. One other reason why people tend to reject the cross is that it rebukes our pride. It rebukes our pride, and not just human pride in general, but all pride. In 1 Corinthians 1, specifically, the pride of the church. And this is where it starts getting close to home. Because the church are the folks who have accepted the message of the cross, but sometimes we lose sight of it. Sometimes we don't hold on to it. Sometimes we don't lift it up in the midst of ourselves and in our own thinking and in our own hearts. And we don't rally around it to solve our problems. And we don't see that it's greater than we are and it is greater than all of our, our difficulties. You see, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25, the church was caught up in self-maximizing and other minimizing. Everybody was wanting to, to build themselves up and hold themselves up and put each other down. And that's why Paul starts talking about the cross. You think you're wise, Paul says. Let's talk about God's wisdom. Let's talk about the cross. Let's lift the cross up in the midst of all of these controversies and all these disputes and all these disagreements. And see what happens when everybody focuses on the cross instead of on themselves People who are not rejecting the cross, but who are failing to see it and who are at times ignoring it. The cross rebukes us for ever thinking that we are the drawing power of the gospel. That people will be attracted to Christ when they see what great folks we are. You know, if we can just polish ourselves up enough, you know, then everybody's going to see us and say, wow, I want to be one of those. And here they come. That's taking pride in ourselves. The message, the drawing power, is Jesus lifted up on the cross. The cross rebukes us for thinking that we have to come up with gimmicks to make the gospel effective. When the power of the gospel is not in the way that we present it, it's in the message itself. It's in the story of the, the Christ who gave himself. That we might live. It has its own power. It's not dependent on us. Paul said I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the power. We're not the power. It rebukes us when we put too much emphasis on numbers. It rebukes us when we think that bigger is always better. Instead of focusing on being the Christ-like people that the cross calls us to be. It rebukes us every time that we quarrel and we, that results in putting ourselves first and others last because the cross is all about putting yourself last, isn't it? That's what the cross is all about. That's why Paul lifts it up to the Corinthians. Follow the example of the cross, he says, and these problems will take care of themselves. The cross rebukes our failure to see that self-denial it's far more powerful than self-centeredness. Well, since so many reject the cross, what should be the church's response? How do we respond to the world's rejection? Do we rail about it? Do we just talk about how dumb those folks are? Do we just uh, sneer at everybody else? What do we do? I want to suggest to you two things that the church needs to do in a world that tends to reject the cross. Number one is we need to be absolutely clear about our message. We need to be absolutely clear about what our message is and what our message is not. Our message, Paul says in verse 22, is Christ crucified. Our message is not ourselves. Our message is not a religious system that happens to include the cross. Our message is the cross. You know, when people tell me sometimes, I don't know how to tell somebody else the gospel, I like to point them to 1 Corinthians. Tell them that Christ died for their sins. If you can't say any more than that, 
Look at what all you've said. You've told them the message that has the power to touch their hearts and draw them to God. Now, the world won't always like our message. Paul knew that the world didn't like his message. He said, I know the Jews don't like it. They think it, it's a stumbling block. The Greeks don't like it. They think it's folly. But he said, it's the only message I've got. And he wasn't trying to match his message to the desires of the world. The church has been guilty of that a lot of times. You know, we've got to find out what the world wants and give it to them. That was the, the mantra about 30 years ago, the church growth movement. Find out what the world wants and give it to them. And a lot of churches did that. And they found it very effective. They found it very successful. But some of them later came to the realization that they were doing everything except making disciples for Jesus. They were just building up organizations. The world may not like the message, but it's the only message that we have. It's the only message that will create genuine faith in the crucified Lord. It's the only message that will point people away from themselves and toward the salvation that God longs to give them. But then the second thing that we need to do is to live out our faith in humility and self-denial. Here's the hard part. Live out that faith in humility and self-denial. Not about just a matter of saying the right things or even just believing the right things. It's living a Christ-like life. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 to 5, just shortly after the, the passage we've been talking about. He said, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty speech or wisdom. Paul said, I wasn't trying to impress you with my education. I wasn't trying to impress you with my background. I wasn't trying to impress you with the philosophies that I knew. I wasn't trying to impress you with my oratory. He said, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I just came in with nothing but that, Paul says. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I didn't have a message except the Christ crucified on the cross, so that your faith would rest there and not in me. You see, we aren't the Savior. We didn't figure all this out. God did. We're just servants. And we're just messengers. And just like everyone around us, we're just sinners with one difference. We've been redeemed by the precious gift that God gives us through the cross of Jesus. Our goal is not to call attention to ourselves and use the faith to our own ends. That's not what it's about. Our goal is in faith to serve God and others and to lift up that Christ and demonstrate that Christ to a lost and dying world. Once we get that straight, once we get that straight, then we will continue to tell others so that Jesus can continue to draw all people to himself through the gospel. It's a personal thing. Have you been drawn by the cross has the cross drawn you out of yourself? Has it drawn you out of your own wisdom? Has it drawn you out of living your own way? Has it drawn you to the point of realizing that you're a sinner and that you need salvation, you need forgiveness, you need to have your sins taken away? Has it drawn you to the point that you were willing to openly confess Jesus as the one who can save you and to be joined with him in the act of baptism, to die to your sins and be raised with him to newness of life? Have you been drawn by the cross? The cross can draw anyone. Will you let the cross draw you? Let's stand and sing.